The Anglo-American loan was the culmination of the United States' attempts to undermine Britain's imperial project, the empire that Roosevelt had once assessed as a greater threat than the USSR was now economically beholden to Washington. Those concessions won in return for the loan were substantial, and American planners could with confidence look forward to the disintegration of Britain's dominions to their benefit. For sure, this was not the imperial route that London had feared and some in the US had wanted. All British colonial possessions were returned at the end of the war, the loan itself meant there would be no fire sale of overseas obligations. Even imperial preference had technically survived, albeit in a heavily defanged form. But the scale of the US victory was about to be driven home, to the extent it surprised even American statesmen. In July 1947, as the terms of the loan had agreed, exchange controls were lifted and the pound was made convertible with the dollar. Some in Whitehall were inclined to welcome this rather than fear it, but Britain lacked the dollar reserves for such a policy. Two thirds of the previous year's loan had already been spent. Consequently, when full convertibility resumed in July, less than two months later, London was once more staring at the economic abyss, as nearly $900 million were converted in a few weeks. It meant reserves were again on the brink of exhaustion. The situation became so desperate that on the 20th of August, the government announced it was suspending convertibility. Had Washington still been the land of Harry White, this could well have been the destruction of the Anglo-American alliance. Yet the US did not seriously try to stop the British government revoking the agreement. In fact, it barely even protested. One of the key aims of American foreign policy during the war, wrung from the British at such effort, had been allowed to lapse. It's worth asking then why? The answer is twofold. In the first place, the pitiful fragility of the British economy put on full display in the crisis had genuinely shocked many in Washington. Was this not the perfidious Machiavellian empire whose pleas of poverty had always rung hollow? The answer was obviously not. It had suddenly become apparent that Britain was a far weaker power than previously thought. She was not trying to use US dollars to revive herself as a genuine rival to America, like White had suspected. In fact, it was using them to simply try and survive. The second reason was found in the East. Roosevelt had hoped to collaborate with Stalin at the end of the war, seeing the USSR as a more suitable partner than the supposedly outdated imperial apparatus in London. But as nation after nation was turned red, something the American public were alerted to in part by one Winston Churchill during a speech in Missouri, it was clear that the Soviet Union, not the British Empire, would be the greatest long-term threat to the American post-war order. In these circumstances, an enormous change in strategic thought occurred in Washington. There was no Damascene conversion towards ideological support for the British Empire, but it was now increasingly seen as a helpful, perhaps essential, cornerstone in the burgeoning Cold War. With Europe and much of the world in ruins, neutral or communist, there was only the British Commonwealth left as a serious possible partner. Thus, when the Attlee government announced it was suspending convertibility once more so as to survive, there was little protest. Indeed, as the Iron Curtain was lowered over the Eastern Bloc and the Secretary of State, George Marshall, became convinced of Soviet hostility, the US was prepared to play a greater part than ever before in assisting Britain and the continent. The resulting Marshall Plan saw around $12 billion worth of aid over a few years transferred to Western Europe. The stated aim was to help the formerly occupied and war-ravaged nations rebuild, Yet Britain, the undefeated power, whose industry was most intact, received the largest share. The reasoning for this was self-evident. Britain was the most important country as far as Washington was concerned. As a State Department policy paper put it, British friendship and cooperation is necessary for American defence. The United Kingdom, the Dominions, colonies and dependencies form a worldwide network of strategically located territories of great military value. It is our objective that the integrity of this area be maintained. Or, as more crudely stated later by Frank Wisner, first head of covert operations for the CIA, whenever there is somewhere we want to destabilise, the British have an island nearby. Elsewhere, the Americans hoped that supporting the empire would mean they would not be dragged into former British commitments, a possibility made all the more pressing by Attlee's personal desire for retrenchment where possible. The greatest test of this came over the eastern Mediterranean, where London decided its presence in Greece and the Straits was too expensive to maintain. 
Washington was viscerally opposed to underwriting British aid here, but when London announced it would be cancelling support to Athens and Istanbul in March 1947, the State Department felt required to forestall any communist advance in the area and offered a generous package of assistance delivered under the so-called Truman Doctrine. That this kind of scuttle did not happen more often was in part down to the British Foreign Secretary, Ernest Bevan, whose intense patriotism and desire for London to remain a world power made him reluctant to undertake further retrenchment, even when it might have been, in the short term at least, economical to do so, Palestine being one example which will be discussed later. Bevin's greatest achievement was overseeing the formation of NATO, spurred on by the close Anglo-American cooperation during the Berlin blockade and subsequent airlift, the alliance confirmed there would be no retreat into isolationism for the US. The fact this was America's first ever peacetime commitment of such a kind represented a remarkable shift in foreign policy. For the British, it was an enormous strategic coup. The country would still have to play a significant role in Western European defence, and all the expense that came with it, whilst the Americans continued to openly question how long their commitment to NATO would last, but for now the risk of facing a Soviet onslaught alone appeared to be over. The changing relationship of the American and British empires in the early post-war period also led to a strategic rethink in Britain. Even before Germany was defeated, Whitehall had begun to believe US aid would be crucial in maintaining the empire and with communism now on the rise, they hoped Washington could indeed prove to be at least part of the solution to Britain's imperial problem. Whilst it was obvious that London would now be adjusting itself to an American-led world order, fundamentally the Commonwealth still had the makings of the third power block that was so often talked about. The Empire had survived the loss of India and remained comfortable east of Suez, with possible new areas for consolidation outlined by Bevan and there seemed to be no reason to think this improbable. Canada remained committed to the imperial cause, most explicitly displayed in their gift of a billion dollars. Australia, after making their wartime appeal for American aid, now like the prodigal son, had returned to the fold under the deeply pro-British Menzies. Even in South Africa, the ousting of smuts by the Africana National Party did not see an immediate imperial break. Indeed, in some respects, such as the pooling of dollars, it became more committed to the Commonwealth. The uniting factor for all the Dominions was a deeply held suspicion about the growth of American power, which naturally drew them back into London's orbit. Yet the war and subsequent decolonisation of India had shown the old methods, slow devolution of power to local rulers whilst retaining control over imperial matters, were unlikely to work in the new world of emerging nationalism. Unable to face this threat alone, it was logical that British statesmen would once again look to the United States. Thus, with the Americans tacitly dropping their hostility to empire, could Washington's resources now be used to help manage Britain's imperium? Our aim, wrote Eden, should be to persuade the United States to assume the real burdens in such organisations, while retaining for ourselves as much political control, and hence prestige and world influence, as we can. He recognised the flaws in this strategy, not least the instinctive anti-colonialism that could never be wholly exercised from Washington, but increasingly agreed with Churchill it was the best possible solution. To what extent this policy can be judged as a success in the pre suez era is one of the most important aspects of the Anglo-American relationship. The best case study is undoubtedly the Middle East. With India lost, Bevin and the Chiefs of Staff identified it as the linchpin for what was sometimes termed the Third British Empire, intersecting East and West. Since the end of the First World War, the region had been dominated by Britain and France, but in 1945, Paris's influence was clearly on the wane, and so Whitehall felt it an area best suited to British power. Since the Great Rebellion of 1916, Britain had been in alliance with the Hashemite rulers of Mesopotamia and the Levant. Egypt, though independent, remained heavily influenced by Britain, and the Trucial states to the south were generally extremely supportive of the British presence. And most importantly, much of the oil industry was either British owned, or at least traded in sterling. It is hoped that by 1951, 82% of our oil supplies will be drawn from the Middle East, Bevan told the cabinet in October 1949. This will present the largest single factor in balancing our overseas payments. What's more, with the Soviets poised in the north, it seemed London should be able to lay claim to American assistance in maintaining its hegemony in the region, if recent US policy was anything to go by. 
Indeed, the National Security Council concluded in a later 1952 report that whatever the US can do to bolster both generally and locally the power of the UK will assist the UK in maintaining stability in the area and will reduce the need for direct action by the US. An alliance of convenience seemed then to make sense. Britain wished to remain paramount in the Middle East. America wished to keep the region stable and immune to Soviet influence without the burden of direct intervention. Theoretically, this entente should have worked. On a case-by-case -case basis, it fell apart almost immediately. The Mandate of Palestine, governed by London since Allenby took Jerusalem three decades earlier, had long been a thorn in the British side. Having withdrawn from all but the Suez Canal zone in Egypt at the end of the Second World War, Whitehall viewed the territory as a potential new base for British power in the region. The problem they faced, however, was dogged resistance from a large section of the local and recently arrived Jewish population. By 1947, the Zionist movement, promoting the need for a Jewish homeland, was an increasingly powerful idea for many in the aftermath of the war's atrocities. During the conflict, Britain had attempted to maintain a balance between the Arab and Jewish populations by cutting off immigration to the territory, though this had inadvertently condemned many in Europe to death. Thousands of Jews nonetheless served in the British army, but some paramilitary groups, like Ergun, responded with a campaign of terrorism against the local Palestinian government. In 1945, Palestine was an attractive prospect for Jewish refugees from Europe. This struck panic into hearts at Whitehall. Such a large influx could not only spark outright war between the Jewish and Arab populations, it would also make demands for British evacuation almost incontestable. To make things even more complex, Britain was not dealing with this problem alone. In Washington, President Truman was frequently petitioned by Zionist groups, quipping that he had more Jews than Arabs in his electorate. Truman put pressure on the British to allow in a significant number of refugees. The ensuing squabble was the first sign that the new Anglo-American alliance over the British Empire was not as stable as it might seem when other priorities overrode US foreign policy. By August 1945, Truman was telling reporters his aim was to let as many Jews into Palestine as possible and still maintain civil peace. Yet British inquiries about whether they would have US assistance in maintaining this peace were met with silence. The president eventually settled on the number of 100,000 refugees, a figure not exactly received with delight in Whitehall. Bevan threatened to publicly demand American military aid in policing the chaos he thought such a number would bring and Truman quietly backed off. This was of little consolation to the British, struggling with a situation that was rapidly unravelling. On the 31st of October, 150 coordinated attacks were launched against Palestinian railway networks by terrorist groups. To try and recruit American aid in hammering out a deal that would allow the British to at least keep bases in Palestine, Bevan proposed a joint committee of inquiry to investigate a solution. But this then had the adverse effect, with several American members convincing themselves upon seeing Palestine that the British were the real problem in Arab-Jewish tensions, and that peace only required their evacuation. The resulting report was an awkward compromise where the proposal for 100,000 refugees was reaffirmed, in return for vague support for the suppression of terrorism by the British. The committee ignored everybody's responsibility but ours, muttered Attlee who also more ironically stated, the United States wants her interests at our expense. And expense was increasingly the overriding factor, as Palestine seemed to become more uncontrollable by the day. British raids on the Jewish agency, effectively an Israeli government in waiting, drew condemnation from Truman. In response, Attlee declared Britain had recovered documents linking the agency to terrorist groups, Scared by this, Ergun staged the King David Hotel bombing on the 22nd of July 1946, hoping to destroy the documents. 91 people were killed. Truman was firm in his condemnation, as indeed were most of the Jewish community, but it was a demoralising blow to the British, whose fortunes elsewhere were also looking grim. Bevin had hoped to reach an agreement with Egypt that would allow Britain to close its Suez base and focus attention on Palestine, but that had stalled over Cairo's claims to the Sudan. By early 1947, with no settlement between Arabs and Jews in sight, the British seemed to have reached a dead end, and Bevin suggested referring the case to the United Nations. This was originally a bluff, as the Foreign Secretary believed Jews would recoil at the uncertainty of UN involvement and become more amenable to an agreement with London. 
Instead, Ergun responded by attacking the British Officers Club in Jerusalem. At the same time, Zionist sympathising groups in America were funding an ever-increasing amount of boats bringing refugees from Europe to Palestine illegally. The Royal Navy was reduced to having to try and stop them within the few miles of British-owned water off the coast. Unsurprisingly, the UN Special Committee concluded the mandate had to be ended as soon as was possible, but their proposed partition of the territory between Arabs and Jews annoyed Attlee who thought it unworkable and unfair on the Arabs. London announced if the proposal did not have the consent of both parties, it would withdraw and leave some alternative authority to implement the plan. When the vote passed, in part thanks to US pressure on those European countries receiving martial aid, the British scuttle of Palestine became complete. As violence continued to spread, Washington at the last moment panicked that such a sudden British evacuation would create a chaos the Soviets could step into. Marshall only now offered US support to Bevin who rejected it as too little too late. The British bailed out and left a war in their wake. Having helped bring an end to British rule in Palestine, the US now moved on to torpedoing London's next proposal for the region. Abdullah, King of Jordan, had been Britain's ally since 1916. Whitehall's ambassador and the King's most trusted advisor, Alec Kirkbride, had fought alongside Lawrence and Faisal in the Great War whilst Britain officers and subsidised Jordan's professional Arab legion. Abdullah had long dreamt of some kind of union for the territories in the Levant, and with both the French and British withdrawing formal rule, this Great Assyria proposal, as it was termed, suddenly seemed like a distinct possibility, as British policymakers finally accepted Kirkbride's urgings. For the Americans, rumours of this proposal would not do. It threatened in particular to block their new pipeline being built to connect Saudi oil fields with the Mediterranean, known as Tapline. Since American investors held a majority of the shares in Aramco, the company in control of Saudi oil, the millions of dollars saved by the pipeline in transportation fees would be of direct benefit to them. A united Levant, controlled by the Saudis' Hashemite rivals, could well block this. However, there was currently no evidence of a greater Syria scheme the US could act on. To ascertain the situation, the Americans managed to find another Roosevelt from their apparently endless supply that they could send out clandestinely. Posing as a journalist, he obtained an interview with Abdullah, who unsurprisingly feigned ignorance. But Kirkbride proved more forthcoming. This idea of separate Syrian and Lebanese republics, that's a lot of nonsense. This all used to be one country, Syria, Lebanon, Transjordan, and what we call Palestine too. It was all Syria. It wasn't till the Versailles Peace Conference and all that stuff came along that it was split up. One kingdom for the whole area could stand up to Soviet penetration, where three or four states can't possibly. Having acquired the confession they needed, the State Department was able to apply pressure in Iraq and Jordan to scupper the scheme. Ultimately, Abdullah would succeed in seizing the West Bank in the 1948 war, but fail in his ambition to unite the whole Levant. For the British, it was yet another worrying sign that the US was not as disinterested in the region as they made out. Greater Assyria was soon forgotten though, for a far worse crisis was about to challenge London's power in the region. The Anglo-Persian Oil Company had long been a vital British asset. Its history went back to the start of the century when an Englishman had purchased a concession to search for oil from the Shah. Initially, it looked like Persia had got the better end of the deal, as attempts to find oil proved fruitless. But in 1908, it was finally struck, with a refinery built in Abaddon five years later. At that point, a young and energetic First Lord of the Admiralty named Winston Churchill bought a controlling stake in the industry for the British government. By 1950, the company's oil revenues contributed a large sum to Britain's balance of payments. The Iranian government had renegotiated the agreement in 1933, but not unjustly considering the accounting trickery that went on in the company to hide the true level of profit, still felt its share of the dividends was too small. This was compounded by events in Saudi Arabia. Here, the Americans had a very similar arrangement to the British with Riyadh, Britain had originally been the Saudis' key ally in the region, but by this time Washington had fairly clearly ousted London. The British were a people of but, and annoyed Ibn Saud once huffed. They will give you assurances, but always at the end, but. Clearly a boob guy. Methodical pressure from the king had eventually seen the Americans concede what became known as a 50-50 split with the Saudi government, 
The theory of the deal sounds obvious, though in practicality it actually ended up with Washington itself, rather than Aramco subsidising Ibn Saud. Unsurprisingly, this type of arrangement was as anathema to the British as it was tempting to Iran. Yet one of the leading figures in the Iranian parliament, Mossadegh, went a step further in calling for full nationalisation of the oil industry. This was felt to be an extreme demand by both the British and Americans, and consequently met with scorn initially. In this, they were supported by the Iranian Prime Minister, Razmara, who, though in favour of a 50-50 deal a la Aramco, argued outright nationalisation would be disastrous, as it would be both illegal and damaging, for he believed the country lacked the expertise and resources to run the industry independently. Though they dragged their heels, by late February, Razmara had secured a commitment from the company to discuss a 50-50 split, but was assassinated before the deal could progress. Iran's parliament subsequently voted for nationalisation, and two months later, Mossadegh himself was appointed prime minister. For their part, the Americans were initially against nationalisation, for the obvious reason that the Saudis may have the same idea if it was pushed through in Iran, but in the face of Mossadegh's commitment to the policy, and the Shah's refusal to challenge him, they basically concluded it was inevitable. This combined with suggestions that London make the process easier by waiving their right to compensation, further served to annoy the British. The new Foreign Secretary, Morrison, increasingly looked to drastic measures, drawing up plans to support a declaration of independence from southern Iranian tribes by landing troops. Acheson, the also relatively new, though far more experienced Secretary of State, thought this sheer madness. His initial statement was even-handed, arguing that Iran needed more control over its oil, but that a unilateral cancellation of the contract would have serious effects. This was not the way Whitehall was used to being treated. He talks to us as if we were two Balkan countries being lectured in 1911 by Sir Edward Grey, was one Conservative MP's response. Under American pressure, the British agreed to offer major concessions, but they were too late, and Mossadegh refused to contemplate anything other than full nationalisation. It was now Washington's turn to feel frustration. Had the Prime Minister considered how Iran would actually operate the oil fields without British aid? The US ambassador asked. Too bad for us, was Mossadegh's response. If the industry collapses and no money comes, and disorder and communism follow, it will be your fault entirely. In 1951, Churchill returned to office determined to settle the matter. By this point, an oil blockade organised by Attali was clearly working. Mossadegh finally offered to negotiate in return for economic aid. Terms abruptly withdrawn in the face of domestic disturbance. For most in Whitehall, this was the final straw, and they began looking at ways to oust the Prime Minister. Atchison was uninterested and distrustful of the plot, supported by the CIA, which expected Mossadegh to have enough popular support to remain in power until at least 1954. The change came with the election of war hero Dwight Eisenhower as president in 1952, though even then a reversal in policy did not come about immediately. The new Secretary of State, Dulles, was undoubtedly competent, but not received with enthusiasm in London. Dull, duller, Dulles, was Churchill's comment. He was keen on American leadership of the world order, and thought Britain a now clearly declining power, whose clumsy behaviour was encouraging nationalists like Mossadegh. When Churchill crossed the Atlantic to meet Eisenhower in early 1953, the new president recorded Winston had an almost childlike faith in the Anglo-American alliance, Ike initially thought Mossadegh was preferable to the communist alternative, and even talked of subsidising Iran in the face of the British blockade. What changed his mind was that the Prime Minister appeared to be moving away from his previous alliance with the country's clerics, and instead gravitating towards the communist two-day party, who were now openly supporting him. Finally, convinced they also could no longer work with Mossadegh, the CIA and MI6 began plotting his downfall. Operation Ajax is an interesting story, but one that cannot be explained in any depth here. Basically, as the result of Anglo-American clandestine actions, Mossadegh was toppled and the Shah restored to full power. In the aftermath, a new oil deal was agreed, which, though giving the British less of a stake, still saved them from the potential horror of nationalisation. Yet in the heat of success, Whitehall seemed to forget just how opposed America had previously been to British intervention. Only when they had helped convince Washington that Iran was liable to fall to communism, which would have threatened US interests, did Washington decide to act. But in London, a different lesson was learned. 
The Americans had little to do with our eviction. They welcomed and facilitated our return and rehabilitation, crowed one diplomat. Such notions were soon to be disabused by the coming crisis in Egypt. This country had been influenced by London since British troops had first intervened in 1882 to restore the recently overthrown Khedive. Cairo gained formal independence in 1922 and agreed a treaty with the British in 1936, but whilst Farouk held the throne, Whitehall was still able to influence the country to some degree through a mixture of threats and incentives. Farouk's corpulent form and clearly quite loose interpretation of Islam, combined with his alleged lapdog status, did not serve to endear him to the people. Yet it took the influence of the United States to topple his crown. In 1952, they supported a coup by the Free Officers Movement. Shortly thereafter, Gamal Abdel Nasser rose to power. The change in leadership surprised the British, but did not alter their strategy, which was to agree a treaty that would allow them to abandon the Suez Canal base, except for technicians, with rights to return in case of a Soviet invasion of the region. The new government in Cairo was naturally fearful of making any concession that could seem like selling out, so would only consider a limited seven-year agreement, with non-uniformed technicians remaining in the base. The reaction in London was one of frustration and rage, Hardliners on the Tory backbenches now objected to any treaty at all, whilst an assailed Eden blamed the influence of the US in Cairo for Egyptian intransigence. Yet it was uncomfortably clear that nothing but that influence could induce the Egyptians to sign. In 1953, Churchill asked Eisenhower to withhold economic aid to Egypt until a treaty was agreed. The President's response was to inquire whether Britain would be willing to join the US in opposing China's entry into the United Nations. It increasingly seemed as if it was Washington roping Britain into supporting its foreign policy rather than vice versa. Nonetheless, Dulles finally agreed that NASA should be told American aid would depend on Egypt keeping all the terms of a treaty. In response, the British gave way on the question of technician uniforms and reduced the agreement length to seven years. Initially, the British hoped that this would pave the way for a revival of their waning Middle Eastern power. They were not unsympathetic to the three officers, and NASA was compared to a figure in the mould of Ataturk, an honest realist they could work with. Yet the involvement of Washington seemed to hang over the canal base agreement like a dark cloud. British negotiators were convinced the US ambassador in Cairo, Caffery, had long been torpedoing their efforts. That it was only when the US agreed to support Britain an agreement was reached, offered a humiliating indication that British strength was rapidly on the wane. US influence of Cairo's policy was all the more disconcerting in view of Egypt's growing rivalry with Britain's last major partner in the region, Iraq. Whitehall hoped to establish the kingdom as the centre of a new alliance known as the Baghdad Pact to resist Soviet influence. NASA, who was described as holding an almost pathological hatred for Iraq, was determined to prevent something that could usurp Egypt's claim to Arab leadership, and worked with Saudi Arabia to block Jordan's entry to London's fury. Yet at the same time, Washington was beginning to lose its patience with the Egyptian Prime Minister. Dulles' pet project had been a peace deal between Egypt and Israel, but Nasser continued to drag his feet, whilst hoping to secure a large arms purchase from America. Dulles feared such weapons would be used against Israel. With negotiations seemingly at an impasse, Nasser turned to the Soviets, who agreed to supply him. He appears to have only intended this as a warning shot to the US, but Dulles was incensed at what he viewed as a betrayal. Soon after, at the UN, he met the new British Foreign Secretary, Macmillan, taking over from the now Prime Minister Eden. The two men gelled immediately, and spent the day winding each other up over Egypt. Dulles lauded the British Empire to Macmillan, and asked him whether he thought Britain had enough troops to reoccupy Cairo. The Foreign Secretary thought they did. For the British, the final straw came in March 1956, when the leader of Jordan's Arab Legion and advisor to the new king, Lub Pasha, was dismissed. Eden blamed Nasser personally for pressuring the monarch to do so. In fact, the Egyptian Prime Minister had done nothing of the sort, and was as surprised as the British by Glub's dismissal. But in Whitehall, it appeared to be the final proof that Nasser was actively working to eject Britain from everywhere in the Middle East. It's him or us, don't forget that, Eden declared to one colleague. 
When Whitehall received intelligence reports that NASA had agreed to collectivise the Egyptian economy in return for Russian aid and was preparing to invade Israel, it was decided that he had to go. The following week saw plans made to increase support for Britain's Arab allies and detach Saudi Arabia as Egypt's partner, along with options for destabilising NASA domestically. But Eden, at this point a sick man whose nerves were clearly shot, disliked such a complex game. His solution, as he shouted down the phone to one colleague, was to simply have NASA murdered. Yet, apart from the Prime Minister's unhinged babbling, Britain seemed to be in luck. It was well understood ousting NASA without active support from Washington would be difficult. But American opinions were also hardening. Egypt had finally confirmed there would be no peace treaty with Israel, and it was felt in the US that Cairo had strung them along dishonestly. At a conference with Lloyd, Macmillan's replacement at the Foreign Office after he moved to the Exchequer, Dulles said the US might have to ditch NASA. When he heard of it, Eden assumed ditch to mean Washington was also looking at regime change in Egypt, and thus began a series of disastrous miscommunications. Eisenhower's actual preference was to switch US focus in the Middle East and strengthen the relationship with Saudi Arabia. The new king, previously an Egyptian ally but now increasingly concerned by NASA's popularity, seemed like a much better bet from the American perspective, and Saud subsequently expelled an Egyptian military mission from his country. Although both were working to different objectives, Britain and the US had eventually arrived at the same result, with NASA now isolated in the Arab world. The final plank left to remove seemed to be funding for the Aswan Dam, part of Egypt's economic modernisation and promised by both countries a year earlier. Cancelling it would leave the Soviets the choice of either having to pick up the whole tab or withdrawing their influence as well from Egypt. Ironically, the British now hesitated, prophetically sensing this final step would bring reprisals from NASA. Dulles ignored them and announced the decision anyway, with the British following suit. When the Russians refused to fund the whole project, NASA resorted to a desperate ploy and announced his intention to nationalise the Suez Canal, so as to use its tolls to pay for the dam. The canal was mainly owned by British and French shareholders, London having purchased its stake from the then bankrupt Khedive in 1875. Though the logic of holding the canal so as to shorten the route to India was long dead, two thirds of British oil still passed through it. NASA has his boot on our windpipe, screeched Eden. Although shareholders were compensated fairly for the nationalisation, the move was thought to break the 1954 Anglo-Egyptian Treaty, an agreement Eden had been instrumental in forcing through over the objections of Tory hardliners, who now jeered they'd been right about NASA all along. Worse, the popularity of the nationalisation would go a long way to restoring NASA's position as leader of the Arab world, Hit him, Nuri, the Prime Minister of Iraq who was sat next to Eden when he received the news advised. Hit him hard and hit him now. Had the British been able to do so, they would probably have gotten away with it. In Washington, support for ousting NASA had reached boiling point. United States Admiral Arle Burke, who would later in the crisis offer to blow the Royal Navy from the Mediterranean, at this point argued NASA must be broken, and that if Britain resorted to force to do so, we should declare ourselves in support of their action. The Senate Majority Leader, Lyndon Johnson, likewise told Eisenhower on the 12th of August that the United States should assure Britain and France they had our moral support and that they should go on in. As it was, the military was unprepared to strike and would need at least six weeks, by which time public anger throughout the West had largely died down. The solution was to find an alternative pretext for intervention, which the French were about to provide. The plan was that Israel, to whom NASA had immediately closed the canal, would invade and lunge towards Suez. Britain and France would then intervene as peacekeepers to secure the canal for international use. Whitehall was sceptical about working with the Israelis, which could upset their Arab allies, but Nouri himself encouraged Britain to work with Tel Aviv. The remaining problem then was the US. Whilst belligerence had seemed to be the order of the day in July and early August, opinions had since become less sure, not least because of Ike and Dulles' own reservations. The British attempted to gain an answer as to whether the Americans would support firm action against Egypt, or at least stand aside. As one diplomat told Dulles, the British hoped they would be with them in this determination, but if we could not, they would understand and our friendship would be unimpaired. 
Dulles and Eisenhower, however, feared the impact such action would have on international opinion. On the other hand, Eisenhower also talked of not letting NASA get away with this action. In fact, for all he waffled on about our people's feelings being against military action, as John Charmley points out, Washington never actually made clear they would oppose it. The closest Ike probably came was a letter to Ethan on the 8th of September, in which he argued intervention might cause a serious misunderstanding between our two countries. Yet if American policy was erratic, they could perhaps with justification argue this was because London was not being straight with them. Eden had taken from his correspondence with Eisenhower and Macmillan's meetings with Dulles that so long as Britain went through the motions of looking for a diplomatic solution, the US would not oppose military action. What actually happened when Israel invaded the Sinai Peninsula and Operation Musketeer was launched in November was that the collusion appeared obvious to everyone and Britain's negotiations in the UN were seen as being in bad faith. Although militarily the campaign was a near complete success, Washington was furious. A genuine protest would have surprised the British. That the US actually took action against their ally left London utterly shell-shocked. They were warned America was drafting a UN resolution supporting economic sanctions against Britain and France. Ike threatened to sink the pound, whilst the US 6th Fleet literally shadowed and harassed the Royal Navy in the Mediterranean. This was then compounded by Macmillan, who morphed from being an extreme hawk to complete dove and lied about how much had drained from Britain's currency reserves. Arguably, Britain could have survived all of these problems. Had Macmillan given the actual figure of the drain on British reserves, 30 million rather than 100, the government might not have panicked so completely. Yet it's worth considering that Egypt was not some passive player in this. Although its military was largely beaten, the population had rallied around Nasser, and how the British genuinely planned to oust him after seizing Suez is not clear. Kissinger later commented for this reason that though Musketeer was a flawed plan, the question remained over whether the US really needed to be so brutal with its alleged allies. Whatever the case, the shock of US hostility was enough for Eden to call off the operation. Within two years, the Iraqi monarchy had fallen, and British influence in the Middle East was nearly extinguished. In the aftermath, the lid that seemed to have been kept on American anti-colonialism for a decade was very clearly blown. Far from seeking to prop up British control even nominally any longer, Eisenhower and Dulles, in George Herring's words, now rejoiced that European influence in the region was on the way. Washington tried to step into the gap with the Eisenhower Doctrine, which would see them intervene in Syria and Lebanon in the near future, though they were also given short shrift by NASA, who denounced it as imperialism by other means. British hopes of maintaining the empire in part through the resources of the United States were gone. Macmillan soon after ascended the premiership and re-established the relationship, but he knew under what terms he was doing so. We must play Greeks to the Romans, he announced. Finding a closing date for the Anglo-American competition is impossible. There was no set moment when London gave up the ghost, and to some extent there never has been. Britain continued to maintain a formal empire for several years after Suez, and the hallmarks of the British financial order only really disintegrated in full with its entry into the EEC in 1973. Fundamentally, Britain remains a sovereign country, and negotiates with America as such, but hopes of controlling a Commonwealth able to stand shoulder to shoulder with Washington are long dead. A series such as this, focusing effectively on a single issue, cannot but give off the impression that the Anglo-American competition has been the reason for British decline and American ascendancy. This, it must be made clear, is not true and represents only part of that story. The competition was never a zero-sum game where one power had to lose as decisively as Britain did, whilst the other had to win as decisively as the United States has. It's possible to imagine a world where there were no great wars in the 20th century and both remained great powers of a relatively equal footing. That the United States has dominated the globe so successfully since 1945, whilst Britain has reduced itself so comprehensively, has as much to do with domestic policy as competition in the Middle East or squabbles over imperial preference. And from a British perspective, of all the possible powers that could have taken over from British hegemony in the 20th century, the United States is surely the most benevolent for a commercial power like London that relies on freedom of the seas and a relatively stable financial system.
Perhaps that in part explains why British foreign policy has tended to see siding with the United States as a sort of duty compared with other European nations. Whatever the case, nothing can alter the fact that Anglo-American history from 1814 has been a story of one power's rise and one power's decline.